ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय So we're reading from the uh, sixth canto, chapter six. It's entitled "The Progeny of the Daughters of Daksha." It's the um, we're finishing the chapter today. It's twenty-four to uh, forty-five. So the verse on the board is forty-five. Tam vavire suragana swashiyam. Duishatam api vimatena parityaka guna angirasena yat tambavire suragana swashiyam duishatam api vimatena parityaka Gunan gira senayat, tambavire suragana, swashiyam duishata mapi, vimate na parityakta, gunan gira senayat, tambavire suragana. Swashiyam duishatam api vimate na parityakta gunangira senayat. Anyone else? Tam him Vishwarup Vavire accepted as a priest. Suragana, the demigods. Swashiyam, the son of a daughter. Duishatam, of the inimical demons. Api, although. Vimatena, being disrespected. Parityakta, who were given up. Guna. By the spiritual master, Angirasena, <coughs> Bhuyaspati, Yat, since. Although Vishwarup was the son of the daughter of the eternal enemies of the demons, the demigods accepted him as their priest, in accordance with the order of Brahma, when they abandoned by their spiritual, when they were abandoned by their spiritual master, Bhuyaspati, whom they had disrespected. So today is the um, we're reading from 24 to 45, which is the end of the chapter. So I'll read all the verses today, but I wanted to give some perspective on the chapter. This is not necessarily the chapter that uh, 
the devotees like to speak on because there's um, it's all about progeny she gave birth to the clouds she gave birth to the cities she gave birth to the tigers so but there is some perspective to this chapter um, it's actually the chapter in the um, in the whole Bhagavatam that has the most information on procreation of progeny in the fourth canto it's a lot of the creation you have progeny in the ninth canto eleventh canto and so on but this chapter is totally on uh, developing progeny so there's some perspective uh, on that chapter so I'm going to try to give the perspective uh, on this chapter and then I'll also read the verses we can see that um, there's always a need for creating progeny according to Jiva Goswami every time there's a at the end of a Manu there's a Palaya there's a destruction not a complete destruction but at least on the Boom Mandala platform which is the middle planetary system made of the seven islands where we stay there's a Palaya or a destruction so that's why we see in the beginning during Swam Bhuva Manu there's procreation you see it also without because we on the seventh Manu it said that uh, each Manu lives 71 times the four cycle so 71 times four million and so years that's the life of one Manu so we are on the seventh Manu this is happening on the sixth Manu Chakshusha Manu now you see Daksha came in that chapter and Daksha also appeared in the Swambhava Manu which is the first Manu so because he committed so many offenses for about four Manus until the fifth Manu he did austerities Tapasya and then in the sixth Manu Krishna arranged for him to come back in the same capacity so there's always a need for procreation or creating progeny because of these Pralayas now when Lord Brahma comes he comes from the lotus flower and he starts creating all the three planetary systems he starts creating the main demigods his main sons and then he empowers them to create all this is done through the power of the mind actually in the first uh, Manu Daksha comes through the thumb of Lord Brahma I think but because of offenses and he was born from Brahman but because of offenses he was born again as the daughter of the son of Ikshatriya through the semen through semen, sem, seminal discharge because of his offenses Papa says it's difficult to understand uh, how karma works but that's how Daksha had to reappear but Lord Brahma created through the mind actually Daksha also in the first Manu and the sixth Manu where we are tried to create through the mind but for him it didn't work at all therefore Brahma gave him a wife and Krishna gave him a wife also on the sixth Manu and Prabhupada explains and I don't know if it's from the first Manu or the sixth Manu that since then because it didn't work mentally he decided that he decided to do it through sexual intercourse that all living entities are born through sexual intercourse from that time on so so this Palaya this destruction always requires more and more progenies so how it starts in the sixth Manu which is Vajvajvata Manu which is a uh, Chakshusha Manu I'm sorry Chakshusha Manu we're in the Vajvajvata Manu so it all started with the Pachetas so King Pachinabai said had hundred sons he told them you go meditate in that lake and he meditated they sang a song offered to them by Lord Shiva and the Lord appeared to them and they became self-realized and they got the blessings that you will be able to go and create progeny but you will not be affected you'll be able to enjoy to the extent of your desire but you'll never get entangled imagine you can enjoy as much as you want but you won't get entangled that's a boon that a lot of people would like so when they came out of the water there was no human beings left demigods were there but there was no apparently there was no humans there was only trees everywhere so in the same way that Lord Shiva opens his mouth and throws fire and air to destroy the world they also in the same way out of anger someone other they got so angry they started destroying all the trees through fire so Lord Brahma came this is not described in this uh, canto but in the first canto and the fourth canto Brahma came and then Soma came Soma is a representative of the trees and they told him to stop and to pacify them they offered them a, uh, a wife Marisha 
Now Marisha was born of Pramlocha. Indra is always jealous of, sa of sages if they become too strong in austerities. So he sent some apsaras, some beautiful women, to make them fall down. So there was a sage called Kandu. So from the union of Pramlocha and Kandu came this Marisha, who became the wife of the Pachetas. So the, generally what the Apsaras do, they have babies and they, they just abandon them. Same thing happened for uh, uh, Menaka when she came to Alua Vishva Mitra. They just abandoned the child. So by Krishna's grace, the trees, they actually, because there's personality and everything, you'll see how there's a creation that the ladies are creating the clouds. They're creating the muhutas. The muhutas are these demigods that control the karma of living entities, past and present and future. And they're creating cities. And we know in Europeans, even now, in, or lastly in cities in Europe, every city had a saint. There was a personality into these cities. So everything has a personality. And there's a demigod for every second, every muhuta, controlling everything of the material world and our destinies. Every demigod is created in this way. So there's a personality uh, in this way. So, so the trees, the personality of the trees, they took care of Marisha. And because she was crying, she, could, she didn't have anything to eat, Soma put her finger, his finger into her mouth and she drank nectar and she survived in this way. So they offered Marisha to, uh, to the Pachetas. And the Pachetas were 100 of them. It's explained that a woman should only accept one husband, but sometime, what? No, hundred. Only fourteen potatoes? Only fourteen? Okay, well, let's go for fourteen. I thought a hundred. Anyways, <coughs> how many? One hundred, yes, one hundred. Yeah, one hundred. Anyways. So, detail. But um, generally a wife should accept only one. But when the wife is very qualified, sometimes like uh, Draupadi, she may accept more husbands. If the wife can see all the husbands equally, then she can have more husbands. This is explained in this way. So, she got all the pachetas and from her came, from, came Daksha. And then from Daksha, that's when he started creating for the... Uh, for the sixth Manu, the Chakshusha Manu. Then he tried it through his mind again, and then it didn't work. So then he took sannyas, and he went to meditate. And then that's how he did the Hamsa Guya prayers. And then the Lord appeared. And because his desire for enjoyment was so huge, Krishna granted him, although Prabhupada said it wasn't a real boon, a devotee would never ask to be able to enjoy unlimitedly. Because if one enjoys unlimitedly his senses, he becomes offensive. In the same way that Daksha became offensive to uh, Lord Shiva, he became offensive to Narada Muni. And that creates fall down. So at that time, Krishna gave him a wife, Akshini, I think. Akshini or something. And through his wife, that's when he started the progeny. So he was very happy. He got 10,000 sons. He was thinking the creation is going very well. But then Nara came and made them into devotees. So, so then he said he did another hundred, hundred, uh, one thousand sons. Same thing happened. Lord Nara Muni came and he um, made them into devotees. So then Daksha was thinking, I'll make daughters. Because if I make daughters, at least they're not going to, uh, Nara Muni is not going to come and preach to them. So he made his daughters and the daughters were distributed to the different demigods. And that is that chapter here describing the progeny uh, from these different uh, demigods. So when you read these chapters, you're thinking that this chapter, you're thinking it's a little bit... I mean, a lot of things that we read in the Bhagavatam, like, you know, the distribution of millions of cows, uh, a lot of things seems very far-fetched. It's like from another realm. But it's not so far-fetched. This is actually the alternative to the theory of uh, evolution. There's no use uh, criticizing the theory of evolution if you don't have anything to present. But actually, if you study well this chapter, you'll see it's not so far-fetched 
to understand what is, what is uh, presented here. In evolution it says everything started from the bacteria and from that bacteria everything evolved. That is also pretty far-fetched if you think about it. But Krishna says that um, he's a seed-giving father. Because Jenny, what happened is one species can give life to only the same species. The genes of the father, the genes of the mother, they get together and they give the information to the embryo to develop based on that and it becomes the same species. You generally don't see one species creating another species. Because that information is not in the genes. But Krishna says, I'm the seed giving father. That means that he has information for all living entities. He has all the genes. So when Krishna, when Lord Brahma comes, that information is pass, passed on unto Lord Brahma also. That means he also has all the information for all living entities. Lord Brahma is the secondary creator. He's not the first creator. Everything is given to him. It's like a construction person who takes bricks and mortar and builds. He doesn't create the, the sand to make the bricks. So Lord Brahma gets also all these seeds. And when he creates a son, partially, they also receive a certain amount of seed or genes for creation. And it's passed on in this way. And the daughters of Daksha also, they got these, a certain amount of certain genes. Now if you think about it, if you look in the Bhagavatam, like for example, the demigods and the demons, they have the possibility to create, to take on different forms. Now we can create different forms in the mind also, but they're not substantial forms. Like for example, Agasura became a snake. How did he die? He died as a snake. That wasn't his original form, but he died as a snake. For one year they left him there, and then they went back after one year. Now Putana, she took a form of a beautiful maiden, but she died in her original form. Still the form was substantial. The yogi says can multiply himself seven or eight times, but it's the same form and it's doing the same activity. But the demigods and the demons have the possibility, like for example, when uh, Bali Maharaj overcame the, the demigods, it says that Indra and the demigods took the form of animals to run away. So they took substantial forms. They have subtle forms and through these forms they can actually take on various forms. You have the story of Rantidev, Rantidev Maharaj. So he was fasting and the demigods decided to test him. So first they sent a Brahmin. They even sent a dog, a Mletcha. These were all demigods who took these forms. Or Sidi Maharaj. They want to test how charitable is Sidi Maharaj. So they sent this eagle and this pigeon. And the pigeon said, this eagle wants to eat me. He said, I'll protect you. Then the eagle said, well, I'm also your, uh, your, um, I'm also in your kingdom. You have to take care of me also. So Sidi Maharaj started cutting his flesh to cover the weight of the pigeon. But the pigeon was going heavier and heavier and heavier. At one point, Sidi Maharaj wanted to throw himself on the scale for the eagle to eat. But then the demigods, I think, um, I think the eagle was Lord Brahma and Indra was the pigeon, I'm not sure. And there are two demigods. Is that it? Do you remember? So two demigods. So they actually took the shape of animals. So it's not far-fetched to see how the demigods and the demons, they can take different forms. They can fly, they can become birds. We don't have that power, that mental power. We have the mental power on the subtle level. We can try to create in our minds, but they actually become substantial. So it's not far out to see they may, they may also have the genes to create different species, like Yami. There's an example of Yami. So Yami, she, take, she took on the form of a stag, huh? not a stag, of a, uh, of a horse. I forgot the name. And she created the Ashwini Kumars. Now Ashwini Kumar means small horses in Sanskrit. I mean, incidentally, although the Ashwini Kumars are not horses. So she took that form and she did, she created. So through these verses you'll see they create humans, demigods, 
Because even though the demigods were not wiped out, the humans were wiped out by the demigods, they're still creating in the three worlds. So you'll see through the verses, they're creating the tigers, they're creating the horses, they're creating the clouds, they're creating the cities. This is something difficult to understand from a material perspective, but if you think that they have the um, engineering capacity or they have the seed or they have the genes within their bodies to do that, then it doesn't become so far out. And this is what actually is happening in this chapter and that's how creation is being, uh, is being developed. So I'm going to read the verses and then we can comment a little bit. So this is from 24 to 26. So thereafter the king of the moon, because the moon offended uh, Pajapati Daksha, oh he got offended anyways, so he cursed him that he couldn't have any children. He got 27 of his daughters, but he couldn't have any children. So thereafter, the king of the moon pacified Pajapati Daksha with courteous words, and thus regained the portion of light he had lost during his disease. Nevertheless, he could not beget children. The moon loses its shining power during the dark fortnight, and in the bright fortnight, it is manifest again. O King Pariksit, now please hear for me the names of Kashyapa's wife, from whose wombs the population of the entire universe has come. They are the mothers of almost all the population of the entire universe, and their names are very auspicious to hear. They are Aditi, Diti, Danu, Kashta, Arishta, Surasha, Ila, Muni, Kodavasha, Tamra, Shurabi, Sharama, and Timi. From the womb of Timi, all the aquatics took birth. So all the fish, everything from the sea came from Timmy. Again, the principle that she had these genes, she had these... Obviously, this is a theory that, that was presented by um, Sadaputapu, presented. I heard a class in the 80s, how we presented in this way. This is not in the books. But Sadaputta was very um, important in... Like, for example, for the TOVP now, all his books and all his archives are brought here to understand actually how to be able to do this chandelier or how to do all the uh, cosmology, how to create it. He was very uh, important in, in helping us understand the fifth canto also, the Bhagavatam. Now, Shida Swami, um, not our Shida Swami, but the uh, godbrother of Prabhupada, he also took time with Prabhupada to explain the fifth canto. They were discussing the fifth canto together because the fifth canto is difficult to understand, the cosmology. But Sadaputta Puru went further to explain to us a little bit better and he helped his con understand better, you know, how the cosmology and also how the progeny is developed. So that is coming also from his uh, understanding. From the womb of Timi, all the aquatics took birth, and from the womb of Sharma, the ferocious animals like the tigers and lions took birth. My dear King Pariksit, from the womb of Surabi, the buffalo, cow, and other animals with cloven hooves took birth. From the womb of Tamra, the eagles, vultures, and other large birds of prey took birth. And from the womb of Muni, the angels took birth. There was a, uh, I don't know who he was speaking to, one of the artists. Um, and they had painted the Gandavas with uh, wings. So Prabhupada said, Gandavas don't have wings. So angels don't have wings, in that sense. Because Prabhupada was uh, always expert in telling. That's why the artists had so much association with Prabhupada. He would tell them, come anytime. And he would explain to them the form. Like Jam Bhavan, he said it's a little bit like a fat American, big fat man. Sometimes we have different conception, but Prabhupada knew exactly how things looked like. The sons born of Kodavasha were the serpents known as Dandashuka, as well as other serpents and the mosquitoes. All the various keepers and trees were born from the womb of Ila, and the Rakshashas, bad spirits, were born from the womb of Suasha. The Gandavas were born from the womb of Arishta, and animals whose hooves are not split, such as the horse, were born from the womb of Kashta. O king, from the womb of Danu came sixty-one sons, of whom these eighteens were very important. Dwimuda, Samba, Arishta, Ayagriva, Vibhavasu, Ayomuka, Sankushira, Swabanu, Kapila, Aruna, Puloma, Vrishapava, Ekachaka, Atutapan, 
Tumareksha, Virupaksha, Vipachiti, and Dudraya. The daughter of Swarbanu named Suprabha was married by Namuchi. The daughter of Vishapava named Samishta was given to the powerful king Yayati, the son of Nahusha. Vaishnava, the son of Danu, had four beautiful daughters named Upadhanavi, Ayashira, Puloma, and Kalaka. Iranyaksha married Upadhanavi and Katu married Ayashira. Thereafter, at the request of Lord Bama, Pajapati Kashyapa married Puloma and Kalaka, the other two daughters of Vaishnavana. From the wombs of these two wives of Kashyapa came 60,000 sons, headed by Nivataka Vacha, who are known as the Pulomas and the Kalakeyas. They were physically strong and expert in fighting, and their aim was to disturb the sacrifices performed by the great sages. So not only the demigods or the um, people in uh, Sadvakun were born, but also the demons or the Rakshasas, they were born to disturb the sacrifice of the, um, of the sages. My dear king, when your grandfather Arjuna went to the heavenly planets, he alone killed all these demons, and thus King Indra became extremely affectionate towards him. In his wife, Simhika, Vipachiti begot, begot 101 sons, of whom the eldest is Rahu, and the others are the 100 Ketus. All of them attain position in the influential planets. Now please hear me as I describe the descendants of Aditi in chronological order. In this dynasty, the Supreme Personality of God in Narayan descended by his plenary portion, expansion. The names of the son of Aditi as follow, Vivashwan, Aryama, Pusha, Twashta, Savita, Bhaga, Data, Vidata, Varuna, Mitra, Shatru, and Urukram. Samkhya, the wife of Vishvash, Vivashwan, the sun god, gave birth to the Manu named Shatadev. And the same fortune wife also gave birth to the twins, Yamaraj and the river Jamuna. The Nyami, while wandering on the earth in the form of a mare, gave birth to the Ashwini Kumaras. Chaya, another wife of the sun god, begot two sons named Sanicha and Savani Manu, and one daughter, Tapati, who married Samvarena. From the womb of Matika, the wife of Aryama, were born many learned scholars. Along them, Lord Brahma created the human species which are endowed with an aptitude for self-examination. So this goes, definitely defeats the theory of evolution in the sense that it's not, the Prabhupada said that my grandfather was not a monkey. In the sense that it's not that one species evolves into another species. All the species were created at the same time. <coughs> and, at the, and they all coexisted. Now some species may not be existent anymore, not in our realm. Like Prabhupada speaks about these Timangala fishes, uh, they go from one planet to another, the planet of these big birds that fly and they actually, through the, um, through the friction of the air, they deliver the eggs in space. So Prabhupada, when he gave this lecture, he always had this twinkling eye looking how people are going to react, speaking about such controversial things. So someone asked, it is difficult to believe in these birds. And Prabhupada told him, he says, what do you know? You're still in the womb of your mother. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that we can't understand because it's beyond our senses of comprehension and they're in different realms. But it doesn't mean that they're not there. So here it's explained clearly how things are being created and how these living entities of extraordinary power can create the whole uh, progenies in this way. From the womb of Matika, the wife of Aryama, were born many learned scholars among them, Lord Brahma created the human species. So you see, the human species were created at the end. It also in the first, in the fourth canto, when Suvambhu Brahmanu and his wife create, the, the species also, the humans, are not coming immediately. <coughs> which are endowed with an aptitude for self-examination. So here it is explained how the humans have this possibility for self-realization. Even though it's not the most advanced species materially or in terms of enjoyment, it has an aptitude for self-examination or self-realization. Rachana, the daughter of the Deitya, became the wife of Pajapati Twashta. By his seminar, he begot in a womb two very powerful sons named Sanivesha and Vishvarup. Although Vishvarup was the son of the daughter of the eternal enemies, the demons, 
The demigods accepted him as their priest in accordance with the order of Brahma when they were abandoned by their spiritual master, Brihaspati, whom they had disrespected. Thus ends the Bhaktivana purport of the sixth canto, sixth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Progeny of the Daughters of Daksha. So, just to summarize, there's different pralayas, there's different destruction, there's always a need for creation of progeny. That's why we see in the Bhagavatam there's progeny created and we get mixed up which manu it's in. That sometimes this son is in that portion and then in another manu is in another portion. So because of these pralayas there's always different progenies. These progenies are created by one Pajapati. So in this manu is, is uh, Pajapati Daksha who is trying to do it through the mind. And it wasn't working. It wasn't working. He was trying to do it like Lord Brahma. So he did say he did it. So then he did his austerities. Krishna gave him a wife, and through sexual intercourse they had children. Since then, all living entities come in this way. And then he had his sons. Narada Muni took them away. He had his daughters, and then finally he did his creation. Pajapati Daksha had such an intense desire to enjoy that he that he. Um, that he did austerities for about four manus. Well, the first, second, third, four. About four, three manus he did austerities. So he did 71 times, four, bil, four million years times three. He meditated on the Lord to, to be able to come back as a Prajapati and to enjoy. But Prabhupada explains that this is not the real benediction because enjoyment uh, without any... Prabhupada explains that we have to control our senses because if we don't control our senses, there's no way to make spiritual advancement in this way. Anyways, this is... Any questions or comments on what I said? Yes, Mataji. father is not a monkey so it seems actually that monkeys are coming from humans because these daughters of Daksha had uh, oh in that sense yeah. and that's but, but they weren't creating they weren't they first of all they were demigods but they weren't creating them as humans I mean if you understand the principle that Lord Brahma is Lord Brahma and from him everything comes right so yes, ultimately everything comes from the demigods, but they don't, they don't not do it, doing it as demigods or humans, they, they, they're giving the seeds for this kind of species. Yes, it's not that the, the transformation of the of evolution, Yes. it's just, as you were mentioning, they have the genes. The genes to create. So a, a monkey comes from monkeys, it's not that it's a... Monkey. In that sense, yes. And another thing I didn't get, uh, since when humans were um, um, procreating through semen, since when? Well, I'm not sure if it's the first Manu or the sixth Manu, but Prabhupada mentions, I have to find the quote again, but I get it, that Prabhupada said when they tried through the mind it didn't work, so then they did it through sexual intercourse, and since then all species are created in this way. I have to find the code, I can give it to you. But I'm not sure if he, Prabhupada speaks about the first, because we know that Daksha also in the first Manu tried doing it through the mind and it wasn't working. And then he was given a wife also, at that time also. So when these daughters of Manu were giving birth to personalities of trees and personalities of cities... The daughters of Daksha, you speak. Daksha, excuse me. They were, give, they were giving birth to persons or to cities? I don't know the details, but I would think he, they were giving birth to, to pre people, like demigods in charge of the cities, or the demigods in charge of the clouds, or the Muttas were demigods, the Ashwini Kumar's medicine, right? So that would be my understanding. But at some point, a human brings into happening that there are cities and clouds and all this. Is it now? I thought it was 8 o'clock. Huh? Oh, for another building, sorry. So at certain moment, the cities and the clouds, but the trees and the clouds uh, come to be, to exist. But it's like the sun planet or the moon planet, right? So it's a, when you look at it, it's a, it's a thing, I mean. 
but there's a personality in it which creates it. We know that the sun god through his chariots, he goes around and that's where the light comes from. But, um, It's very difficult to understand fully because we don't have fully inf information on this, but we can just understand literally what is explained, how the living entities are created through different demigods or different ladies or men, and they create different species that are coming from them, which counteracts the theory of evolution that everything comes through gradual process and everything comes only through the same species. Yes. Yes. We only do this because our genes are for spe human species. But we can understand that Krishna is creating all species through Lord Brahma. That means he has all the, all the information needed to do it. And also when Brahma's daughter took the form of a deer, or, um, I mean, there's so many foul things. When Lord Brahma saw some demigod's woman, he passed semen, that semen was used, and then there was a creation. I mean, it's beyond our mind understanding. I'm not sure, but you can see there's, exa there's examples like this where the, the demons took birth in a certain way. I mean, they took forms and they died in that form. And other examples like Putana, she took a form but she died in her original form. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Point I noted is that Narada Muni preached only to the sons of Daksha, <laughs> not to the daughters. So since then, there was some difference. I completely accept, you know, women, bodied souls, women, bodied souls, male, bodied souls, male, bodied souls. But any more explanation on that? <laughs> Preaching is done only to the men, not to women. Anyway, Prabhupada preached to both. Yeah, but um, it is Narada Muni's um, attitude. We don't understand. No, originally, I mean, from scriptures, it's explained that the, the man's body is more adaptable or more developed for, spirit, for uh, understanding spiritual life. And the, because what happens is when the man thinks of his wife when she dies, he becomes a woman. Mm -hmm. And when the woman dies, thinks of her husband, she'll take at least a man's birth or she'll go back to God with her husband or, or whatever. So, but this, in, this is controversial. Anyways, the point is that Prabhupada preached to both. both are equally bad. So all are given spiritual life. Everyone can do spiritual life. You know, this verse in the Bhagavad Gita says that you be a woman, a man, a shudra. Then as long as you accept Krishna, then you can make advancement. We just have to work all together and make his crown good. Comment if I may? Maybe you can. But um, from the scientific point of view, that there's something called the Human Genome Project, where they're actually taking the, the genes and taking them apart, finding yeah. how they're put together, okay? With the hope of playing with them and creating other species. Anyway, they got a lot of ideas. But when they examine the genetic material of many of the species, there's very little difference between them. Okay. In other words, the, the genetic material that produces a man's form is extremely close to the genetic material that produces a uh, monkey form. There's only one or two differences. Mm -hmm. And even when you get into really far out animals that are completely different from us, almost all the genetic material is, is the same. There's just a couple of genes here and there that turns, that make a sheep's body. You know what I'm saying? It's not like a lot of genetic material. So I'm just thinking, you know, the thing is, is and so therefore they use this to say that somehow or other we all came from one, one microbe and that shows that we're, you know, but, but 
the opposite thing is, is we all come from the original genetic material created by God, and it's coming down that way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just an interesting thing. There's very little difference in genetic material that produces one body to the next body to the next body to the next body to the next body. So you can see how it could be played with very easily by somebody who had the knowledge. <laughs> Yeah. You know how Prabhupada said the Darwin philosophy came upon? He said they did it to destroy the culture of India. The science of Indology was invented by the Britishers because they couldn't conquer India by mass. There were so many people, so they tried to destroy the culture. So they were getting the books and then they were giving bad reviews on the books. And to destroy the uh, idea of karma and reincarnation, then the philosophy of Darwin came up. That's how Prabhupada explains it. It was actually done. But Krishna is so smart that when these English people like, uh, and these Americans, they, they, they started, because when they started the Indology, then all these books started coming to England, and then America, and then Germany. And they started reading the books. So David Thoreau and Einstein and Goethe, all these people started reading the books. They'd say, well, that is very interesting. So Krishna cheated them. Through that, all the philosophy came to the West. And that gave the opening for the for Prabhupada's movement. So Papa Krishna is very very sharp. Any other comments or questions? Anyways, I hope it gives you a different perspective on this chapter. Because generally when you read these chapters you're thinking, uh, you know. Same thing for cosmology because we don't have so much. But actually there's a lot of there to understand uh, how things are being done. Thank you very much, August to Prabhupada.